You'll have to forgive me, I've lost my voice. Um, but it's been a very interesting year um, for Muslims and also for our entire country. Um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there have been 710 acts of violence since the election. In the past year, there have been 230 acts of violence that directly targeted Muslims. And when I say acts of violence, we're talking about attempted murder, arson, um, lighting people on fire. We're not talking about discrimination. And so in the Muslim American history in this country, outside of slavery, 2016, according to the FBI, has been the most violent year for Muslims, against Muslims. And so we're coming at a point where we actually have a conference where the title is Faith Over Fear. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about this title towards the end of my talk. But we're coming at a point where we're asking ourselves, what does it mean that America is being redefined according to the narrative of ethnic, um, ethnic determination or othering or saying people like Muslims and African Americans and Mexicans and women, all of these groups are not from amongst us. We're seeing a rise in, um, in white supremacy. In 2007, there were only 23 militias in this country. Since the election of President Obama, there are now 278 armed militias in America. According to the FBI, the number one threat facing this country is not Muslims, it's white supremacy. And so we need to be aware that there's a changing nature in our country, and we are one of the communities that is most targeted but we're not the only ones. Fear of Islam and Muslims has become prominent today more than it ever has. And part of the research I'm working on is asking, why is it in the run-up to an election, is it acceptable for bigotry against Muslims to be part of the public political vernacular? It's not the first time. In 2008, when President Obama was running, was, was elected, but in, uh, in the run-up to his election, this idea that Hussein Obama might be a, a president. This distrust of Muslims was part of that entire electoral cycle. In the 2010 uh, midterm election, we saw the rise of the discourse around the so-called Ground Zero Mosque, which was not a mosque nor at Ground Zero, but this entire fear of Muslims became part of the election. And as soon as the election was over, it went away. In 2012, it was the anti-Shia legislation that was attempted to be passed in over 21 states in this country. And it was never about getting the legislation passed. It was about instilling fear in Americans about this scary other called the Muslims, this scary SH, world called, SH word called Sharia, which I'll get back to in a few minutes. But really, why is it that it's become acceptable to target Muslims in, in the public and in politics and no one says anything? So we have to ask ourselves our, these deep questions, but I'm gonna take us back to the beginning. Back to the beginning when our Prophet what was he known for? I know we all know this and our kids know it. But when we say our Prophet was a sadiq al amin, what did that mean? I know that we think it means that he was honest and trustworthy, right? We think it was honest and trustworthy. But if I tell you in pre-Islamic Arabia, even though it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, it was a brutal time, it was very tribal, honesty was part of tribal mentality. Honesty was part of your honor. And so what is meant that our Prophet ﷺ was a sadiq al-amin was that he actually spoke truth to power, was that he gave voice to the voiceless, is that he actually stood up for the marginalized. His truth was that no injustice was allowed to pass in his presence. And think about it, in tribal culture, you don't speak against your tribe, but our Prophet ﷺ did. He was known for this. It wasn't about being honest and not being a liar. No, it was about being honest, period, by standing up for truth. And our theology in that regard is incomplete without social justice. In the law, يأمر بالعدل والإحسان, Allah commands us with justice. And in this ayah, uh, uh, adl comes before ihsan. And what is ihsan? 
Ihsan is one of the highest levels of Iman. So if our theology is incomplete without social justice, if our Prophet salam, to be honest, not just meant to be honest in the merchant dealings, which is the way we kind of characterize it, but his honesty was that he stood up for truth. He gave voice to the voiceless. This is what al sadiq al-Amin means. One time the Prophet salam, asked his companions, tell me something that you've seen. And so one had just returned from Al-Habash and he says, I saw a nun carrying a bucket of water. And a young boy came and he snacked the water uh, bucket out of her hands. And she says to him, there will come a time when the Lord, when he purchases his chair, right? When he's on the arsh, your hands and your feet will testify. Because we live in a time now where no one's testifying for us. But your hands and your feet will testify to the truth of what you did. And the prophet hears the story and he says, yes, that is true that even in times where no one's standing up for the truth, the truth exists and it will testify on our behalf. And so, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> when Jafar goes to a, to a, to a Najashi and um, a Najashi was you know, the king of Al-Habash and he's asking him, tell me about this thing, your Islam, right, that your guys are talking about. Now Jafar was only 21 and he says, I will tell you what Islam has done for me and my people. Now remember, he goes to Al-Habash in the fifth year of Islam. And so in the fifth year of Islam, most of the Quran is not even revealed. None of the Madani parts of the Quran are revealed. And so he's telling what Islam has done for him and his people. And he says, it has made us, Islam has taught us to stand up for justice. It has made us stand up for the elderly. It has gotten rid of abuse. It has reorganized our entire society away from brute force to what? To justice. Jafar, and this is a beautiful poem actually, he describes how Islam in its real early beginnings, where most of the Islam that we know is not even yet revealed. He says how Islam, based on justice, completely reorganizes society so that everyone matters. If you really think about what the masjid is or the advent of the masjid was, really think about this. When the masjid was first thought in a creation form, of this is a space where everyone is welcome, irrespective of tribe, irrespective of class, irrespective of gender, and everyone not just belonged but had a voice. The masjid is one of the first democratic spaces that ever existed. And yet we don't understand the value of this in reorganizing an entire structure that says what? Islam is about justice and standing for all. But why am I really saying this? Is because today we don't stand up for others. We don't show up for others. Think about all of the marginalized in this country. And if this election has taught us anything, there are many marginalized communities in this country. It's not just those who are at Standing Rock that we should be standing with. It is not just members of the African American community and the Black Lives Matter mov movement that we should be spearheading. And it's not just the Rust Belt that we have all just awakened to. And I wanna talk about this because I've seen Muslims in the past two weeks embrace this idea of white rage and white marginalization and the Rust Belt that we need to start understanding. And we feel extremely empathetic to what it means to be a worker that's really not getting your due. What that does is it erases black rage. Honestly, brothers and sisters, we have become so sympathetic to what's happening in the Rust Belt in this electoral cycle that we have ignored the fact that these structural injustices have always existed. Let me tell you, a couple of years ago, right before the ICNA convention, it was actually two years ago, in Baltimore, there was the case of Freddie Gray. Freddie Gray was a young African-American male who died in police custody in the back of a, of a, of a police van. He was given a so-called rough ride. Freddie Gray was not the first person to get a rough ride. Freddie Gray grew up in one of the worst parts of Baltimore, in a home that was laced with lead paint. 
He grew up in a place where abject poverty affects 88% of the residents of that part of Baltimore, where only 5% of young people graduate college. And if we in America think that college is the gateway to the middle class, then what does that mean for that part of Baltimore? That they will never get out of abject poverty. That one in three African-American males in this country will be part of the prison industrial complex that's for profit. This is a structural injustice, wallahi, that is so fundamentally against every aspect of our sharia, that a young man can grow up in those conditions, that a young man can, that, ha happen, that happen to him in police custody, that he can be completely denied equal access to education, that he can be arrested. Let me tell you what one of my graduate students told me last Monday night. You know, most of us, but really most of Americans, especially liberal America, is still reeling from the trauma of this election. And so most of my graduate students, is because, of, because I teach foreign policy, they're mainly white males. But I have one African-American grad student who just spent 20 minutes listening to the trauma of many of his uh, friends, and they're really upset. And he says, welcome to the only America I've ever known. I have been stopped and frisked three times. I've seen the bottom of a barrel of a gun, and none of you have done anything for me. When we really think what this really means, we have to stand up for others before we stand up for ourselves. If we think people are gonna stand up for us, that's not gonna happen until we stand up for everyone else. Never in this country, never in the United States, have people been given what they've been asked for just because they sat idly by. Women did not gain the right to vote in this country, or African Americans gained the right to vote in this country, or the civil rights movement. None of this happened by people sitting idly by and waiting for it to happen. If we're really gonna talk about getting rid of systemic injustices that affect every single one of us, every marginalized community, and really all of America, because if people think that those that elected, our president-elect, are going to get economic gains, let me tell you, they've set themselves up for economic failure. And so it becomes our obligation. And then if you really peel back some of the layers and you ask yourself, do you know what the number one community that's affected by suicide in this country? The number one community in America affected by suicide is uneducated white males. They feel like their country is lo no longer theirs. You think we don't owe them reaching out? to understand what they're going through. In New Jersey, where I live, we live in the wealthiest state in the country, but some of the poorest cities exist in New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey, South Plainfield, parts of Newark. If we're really gonna talk about social justice at the local level, how can a place like Camden, 15 minutes away from Moorestown, New Jersey, that's ranked as the happiest place to live in this country, I know people that live in Morristown. I don't know people that live in Camden. What does that mean for us as a community? That we need to actually take care of one another and one another is not just people that look like you and me. One another is really the face of America that's hurting. And unfortunately, because all economists say we will go into a coming economic crisis, we need to understand that this is really problematic. I have two more talks today, so I'll do the positive stuff later, inshallah. So I have one for the sisters, and tonight, inshallah, one for the youth, because the youth, you are the greatest victims of this. And so hopefully you'll come tonight and we'll talk about that, so I'll leave that for later. But I only have two minutes left, so I wanna say one last thing. When we think about what it means to live in fear, fear, the title says faith over fear. But I'm gonna problematize that and say, fear ends when faith begins. If you really think about the value of the lessons of our Prophet um, here in looking at what this woman was telling him when telling the Sahabi, when there was nothing for her to, to testify on her, but she knew that there was justice. Or when Jafar goes to a, a, a Najashi and says, let me tell you what the very little we know about this faith, what it has taught us about justice. 
but more so what it means for you and I to understand that al-sadiq al-ameen alayhi salam, al-sadiq al-ameen meant standing up for truth. And that is not easy. And that requires hard work. If any of us thought that we were going to be put on this earth to sit back and do nothing, we have no idea what life is about. Life is not about living mutma'in, right? And nafs al lawama is looking for tamanina, and that comes from really hard work. And the really hard work doesn't just begin in our homes like the other talks uh, had uh, addressed, but it really means understanding systematic injustice in our home country of America and how Muslims are actually armed with the theological background to fundamentally redefine what it means to be America today. Thank you.